Well, welcome, friends. It's great to be with you again tonight on a Wednesday night Bible study as we continue to advance through the book of Judges. We're going to be looking at the 18th chapter tonight, so if you want to turn there with me in a moment, we're going to be reading uh, the entire chapter. We really do miss spending the time with you and enjoying these Wednesday night sessions, along with, of course, our Sunday services, and we now have hopes, hopes, that we're looking at a matter of weeks and not months before we're able to gather in some form again. Until then, we hold you in our hearts. Over these last few weeks, our staff has been in touch with a thousand plus households. We've been getting great feedback from you. It's been great to hear from you, but we really miss the contact that uh, we have when we share together fellowship. It has really helped me to understand partially what it means to be a human being. We're not meant to live in our little silos. We're not meant to be isolated, but we're meant to do life together. And we really, really miss doing life together here at Calvary. But it won't be long. Let's go a little bit further tonight in Judges chapter 18. And I'm going to read the entirety of the chapter if you want to follow along with me in your own Bible. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in, for until then, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. So the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of their tribe, from Zorah and from Eshtaol, to spy out the land and to explore it. And they said to them, go and explore the land. And they came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of a young Levite. And they turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What is your business here? And he said to them, This is how Micah dealt with me. He has hired me, and I have become his priest. And they said to him, Inquire of the Lord, please, that we may know whether the journey on which we are setting out will succeed. And the priest said to them, Go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people who were there, how they lived in security after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting, lacking nothing that is in the earth and possessing wealth, and how they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. And when they came to their brothers at Zorah and Eshtaol, the brothers said to them, what do you report? They said, Arise, and let us go against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it's very good. And will you do nothing? Do not be slow to go, to enter in and possess the land. As soon as you go, you will come upon an unsuspecting people. The land is spacious, for God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is in the earth. So, 600 men of the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zorah and Eshtaol, and went up and encamped at kiriath Jerem in Judea. On this account, the place is called Manadan to this day. Behold, it is west of kiriath Jerem. And they passed on from there to the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. Then the five men who had gone to scout the country of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that in these houses there is an ephod, household gods, a carved image and a metal image? Now, therefore, consider what you will do. And they turned aside there and came to the house of of the young Levite, the home of Micah, and asked about his welfare. Now, the 600 men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood at the entrance of the gate. And five men who had gone to scout out the land went up and entered and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, the metal image, while the priest stood by by the entrance of the gate with the 600 men with weapons of war. And when these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, household gods, and metal image, the priest said to them, what are you doing? And they said to him, keep quiet, put your hand to your mouth and come with us and be our father and a priest. It's better for you to be priest. Is it it better for you to be priest to the house of one man or to be priest to the tribe and clan in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod, the household gods, the carved image, And went along with the people. So they turned and departed, putting the little ones and livestock and the goods in front of them. When they had gone a distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah were called out and they overtook the people of Dan. 
And they shouted to the people of Dan, who turned around and said to Micah, what is the matter with you that you come with such a company? And he said, you take my gods, which I made, and the priest, and go away. And what have I left? How then do you ask me what's the matter with you? And the people of Dan said to him, do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall upon you and you lose your life and the lives of your household. Then the people of Dan went their way, and Micah saw they were too strong for him. He turned and went back to his home. Now the people of Dan took what Micah had made and the priest who belonged to him, and they came to Laish to a people quiet and unsuspecting and struck them with the edge of the sword and burned the city with fire. And there was no deliverer because it was far from Sidon and they had no dealings with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rabob. When they rebuilt, then they rebuilt the city and lived in it. And they named the city Dan after the name of Dan, their ancestor, who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribes of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up Micah's carved image and he, uh, that he made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. Now, last week, we saw a godless Ephraimite named uh, Micah. He set up for himself an idol. He created his own ephod or his own priestly garment. He hired then a Levite whose identity will be revealed for us later in tonight's study. Ephraim is the hill country in the center of Israel. It's north of Jerusalem, and it is a transit route between the north and the south. There's two ways, really. You can go by the way of the, the hill country, or you can go up the Jordan Valley. This is the hilly route. So even though the tabernacle was at Shiloh at that time, about 19 miles from Jerusalem, by the way, Eli of the Samuel story in the scripture, Eli was a priest around this time to the best of our understanding. Even though the, the tabernacle is functioning at Shiloh, Micah, this Ephraimite, sets up his own worship center just a few miles from the tabernacle. It's an idolatrous worship center with a Levite priest who is obviously deeply corrupt. And the scripture says, as in all of these passages in Joshua, Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In chapter 18, as we just read, the displaced tribe of Dan is introduced to us. They are a tribe without territory, and they have no territory for this simple reason. They did not drive out the inhabitants of the land they were allotted in the south of Israel. They didn't do what they were called to do. And in that absence or that vacuum of power, the Philistines had risen up. They had now absolute control of all of the coastal plains, the south and the west of Jerusalem. These were lands that had been allotted to Dan. They never really took possession of them. And so they lived, they lived in those lands as a secondary or a captive people. Incapable of taking on the Philistines, and possibly losing heart due to Samson's constant uh, battering of, of heads with the, with the Philistines, the Danites decide at this point, post-Samson -Sam now, they decide they're going to go and seek out their own land. They're going north. And again, the text tells us everybody did what was right in their own eyes. It's a key for us. It's a clue for us to understand that God has nothing to do with these dealings. They're doing what they want to do, not what God wants them to do. Now, just as the 12 tribes sent out spies under Joshua's original conquest of the land, the Danites send out five spies. And given the impossibility of taking land in their own region, they go north. And on that journey north, they encounter Micah, this Ephraimite in the hill country, north of Jerusalem, north of Shiloh, and there they are offered the perfunctory hospitality that was uh, indigent to the times, that when, when you were traveling in those days and the evening would come, you would stop somewhere and someone would give you lodging. It was expected that you would offer hospitality. But as we look at this story, we need to understand there are some other things at play here too. 
This is a large party, 600 plus men. They're marching through the land. And as they come to Micah's place, which is rather substantial, they stop, they stop. It's a, it's a part of hospitality, but we find out that the spies who had gone before also, they've, uh, they've got some plans of their own. While they are there, the spies hear the voice of the Levite, probably picking out his dialect or accent. It's, it's not a high probability that they knew him from someplace else. But when they recognized that he was a Levite and recognized that he was with this Ephraimite up in the hill country, they said, what are, what are you doing here? And of course, the answer was, well, I'm a hired priest for Micah. They said, well, that's great. Inquire of God concerning our mission. We're not given much insight into exactly what this priest, what this Levite did, but he told them, go in peace. All's well. Now, don't, don't for a moment take this story as a God-seeking moment. These are godless men seeking an alternative to God's allotment for their lives. And they've been given over completely, completely to idolatry. There's nothing in their actions that indicate any sincere knowledge of the Lord. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So the five journey north, slipping beyond the northern borders of the tribes of Israel, and they come to Laish. Today, you can see those excavations. They're called Tel Dan, Tel Dan. And the site is one of the more fascinating excavations that you can visit uh, in Israel. If you, if you go to Israel, more likely than not, your tour is going to take you to Dan. And I hope that you can go and you can see it. It's truly fascinating. One of the best that you'll see. The city that you can walk around there now that's been excavated and somewhat rebuilt in, in, in part, as you, as you walk through, you're looking at a city that dates back to the days of Jeroboam, but closer, closer to that, or very, I shouldn't say closer, just very close to that, there are excavations that take you back, not to the times of Jeroboam, but take you all the way back to the times of Abraham. It is held by many experts that Abraham himself would have entered the land of promise coming through this, this um, city of Laish, ancient Dan, but even more ancient Laish. And the gate that they have unearthed there, as a matter of fact, the, they've built a canopy over to, to protect it from the rain destroying it. It is such an important archaeological find. So it's not open to the elements, but you can actually see the gate and a lot of experts will tell you they have, good, they have good confidence that Abraham himself at one time walked right through that gate. Now, whether that's true or not cannot be proven. But I have to tell you, there's something very moving about standing there on those stones and you're separated uh, by a fence. You can't go beyond the, the fence to get close to it all because it is such a precious artifact. But standing there and looking at that stone stairway, stepping up towards the ancient city and seeing the arch of the gate and recognizing I'm standing in the path that Abraham once walked, it's, uh, it's moving. It's moving. That gate, by the way, is notable uh, for more than just the curiosity of Abraham, Bronze Age, this tells us that Bronze Age inhabitants constructed the world's oldest known gated archway 1,500 years before the Romans invented the arch. That's what I said. 1,500 years before the Romans, who are credited with the arch in construction, we find in the Bronze Age in Israel, northern Israel, in Laish, we find that same construction. It is an amazing excavation as a whole. And everything you see, everything you see there flowed out of the events we just read in Judges chapter 18. At Laish, they found what they were looking for. The Danites found an excellent land, a people who were somewhat isolated from the regional power that was closest to them, the people of Sidon or the Sidonians. And also, they found a complete absence of warlike apparatus, they found a people who were very comfortable and were living at peace. Traveling back to the south, the spies advocated for the invasion of Laish. 
And 600 Danites armed for war retraced the steps that the spies had had, uh, trod all the way back to the south. And having failed to do what God commanded in conquest, they now are going to attempt a conquest on their own terms. Look, anytime God has called you to do something and you refuse to do it, then later try and do it on your own timetable, in your own strength, you will fail. It happened to the children of Israel when Moses brought them to the gateway of the promised land. They were ready to go up. Remember the spies came back and said, we're able to go up and take the country. We should do it right now. The people rebelled. The people rebelled. And Moses mourned. And the people rethought their circumstances. And the next day, they decided that they would try the invasion. And it was an absolute disaster. God has a time. He has a time. Now these men of Dan are, they want to accomplish on their own terms and by their own power what God would have helped them accomplish if they had only been obedient to his word. For he'd already proven himself that by his supernatural power, he could overcome anything that could have been thrown at them. So as they're going north, these 600 Danites They come to Micah's compound in the central highlands. This impressive force arrives at Micah's front gate, exchanges pleasantries. But while the pleasantries are being exchanged, the five spies slip away and they rob Micah's shrine and his ephod and that's his priestly garment and and they poach his Levite. We might say if we were looking at this in a movie genre, they made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Their sales pitch Do you want to be a priest to a family or do you want to be a priest to a whole tribe? And having 600 armed men standing just outside the compound probably added an additional inducement. The Bible says the priest's heart was glad. He embraced the idea. He's moving on up. He has been recruited to a higher office. Forget Micah. Everything's coming up roses now for him. Well, the Danites continue their journey north, accompanied now by their new priest with all of his gods and idols. And they're soon chased down by Micah and his neighbors. Micah finds out immediately what has happened. The priest is gone. The ephod is gone. The carved image is gone. They've taken off with his religious life. And so he gets his neighbors together and they pursue them. They overtake them along the way. I love, I love the dialogue. He said, Micah, what's the matter with you chasing us down? Micah responds by saying, you take my gods that I made and you take my priest and you go away. And what have I got left? And now you're saying, what's the matter with me? Well, then things get kind of ugly. 600 men are armed for war. Micah is standing there with a few of his neighbors. And Dan's fellows get a little bit nasty. They say, don't say anything less. Let some of our bad boys fall upon you. You're going to lose your life and your household. In other words, shut up or we'll kill you. Go home. Go home. It's a no-win situation. And so he and his neighbors decide that discretion is the better part of valor. And they head, they head home. Though Micah is the loser in this story, he can always buy more idols, make more priests. And while Micah licks his wounds, the Danites advance north on Laish. They fall on that city with the sword and they burn it with fire. They don't just roll in and take over. They want to destroy it altogether build a new city under their own design and under a new name. They want to exalt themselves. The Danites renamed the city Dan and installed their hijacked priest who promptly sets up Micah's idols. Now the priest gets a name. He is Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of... Moses. Now, before we rush to the grandson of Moses here, we we just need to understand that sometimes 
when it talks about sons and grandsons in the scripture, we, we skip some generations. So we're not sure that this is the third generation or the fourth generation, but we are sure of this. This Levite, who had previously been unnamed, he is of the bloodline of Moses, directly in the bloodline of Moses. <coughs> Think about this. These people who came out of Egypt under the godly leadership of Moses, who received the law, who experienced the miraculous power of God like no people on the face of the earth had ever known, in more ways than they could recount, God had shown himself to them. These people are now led spiritually by a grandson or great-grandson of Moses, and that grandson or great-grandson is a godless idolater. He's a godless idolater. It's proof of the saying, God has no grandchildren. Every individual must find God personally and individually. No one is related to God by family tree or by tribe or denomination or even local church. We're not related by pedigree somehow. God has no grandchildren. Two great grandfathers on my fa in my family were preachers. Both of my grandfathers were preachers. My father's preacher, four uncles, preachers. But that didn't make me a preacher. Nor did it make me a follower of Jesus. It's not the family business, although at times, at times it has certainly seemed like it was just that, the family business. Though I learned much from family going before me, I did not enter this vocation without a call, a personal call and conviction for my own life. It is not something, it's not something that I sought. It's not something that I was grafted or adopted into. I didn't want a life in ministry. As I was entering into a later adolescence, I wanted nothing to do with the church. I wanted to be a, a musician. I had plans. On the morning I was saved, in that October of 1976, I had no thoughts of ministry whatsoever when I entered my father's church for another required service. You see, in the house I grew up in, no church, no eat. My dad had it really pretty simple. If you're going to live under my roof, you're going to be in church on Sunday. I know that's considered almost child abuse this, these days, but that's the way it was. On that morning in that church, I had an encounter with Jesus. It was not a vision. It was not an audible voice, but an encounter all the same with the presence of God that I had never really felt before or known like that, and it changed my entire life. As I came to awareness in those moments as to how real God was and how certainly he cared for me, I felt the tug, I felt the call, I felt the irresistible passion welling up in me for a life in ministry. I've never regretted it, and I have never once, not once, have I doubted it. That's the way it is in God's presence. Like most people, I thought that my talents might somehow define my calling, that God would use me in what I was good at, and at the time, music was my thing. I thought music would be my placement in ministry somewhere. But it was soon, soon after this moment of calling, foremost in my awareness, I had this sense that I was called to something beyond all of that. I was called to preach, and I was called to teach. It was confirmed early on in my walk with the Lord, absolutely confirmed I was supposed to go into a preaching, teaching ministry. It was, it was crystal clear. But I had to have my own experience, my own encounter. My grandfather's, as wonderful as it was, and what a story. My grandfather's couldn't do it. My dad's surrender to the will of the Lord, giving himself over to a life of ministry. A wonderful story. His story did nothing for me. Ultimately, what happened is I had my own experience with God. 
He has no grandchildren. He has no grand. You don't grow into it. You have to meet him. Scholar and writer Don Carson has said it well. One generation knows the gospel. The next assumes it. And the third loses it. Think of that. One generation knows the gospel. The next assumes it. The third loses it. I, I think nowhere is this more clearly seen than in Moses' family. What a sham now. What a tragic downfall in the house of Moses we see played out here in Dan. In this a grandson or great-grandson of Moses, they have religion, but they don't have truth. They have gods, but they have not the one true God. They have shrines, but they hold no meaning, nor do they possess power. They have the grandson of Moses, but nothing of the revelation that God gave to Moses for the people in his day. And verse 31, I think, gives us indication of what should have directed the steps of the tribe of Dan. In the closing, in the closing verse, we read it just a moment ago, Judges 18, 31, all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. I love the way the author has set up this 18th chapter. All of this stuff happens. All of these shrines, all of these offerings, the phony ephods, the carved image, the hired priest, all of this while the house of God was in Shiloh within the neighborhood of Micah's idol and his bogus priest. The tabernacle stood there in Shiloh. There, God made it possible for people to approach him, to worship him, to know him, to live in harmony with him. The tabernacle, the place of God's presence among his people was right there in Shiloh. It should have been the focal point for Micah and it should have been the focal point for the Danites. So should God's tabernacle today be for us. The man who is literally the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Jesus has come to be our tabernacle. Our dwelling place is in him. If we don't center our lives on Jesus as the way to approach and worship and know and live with God, we're centering our lives on man-made religion. We're centering our lives on idols, on something that he cannot bless. The story of Dan is a story of another generation that has only a vague awareness of where it came from. It's no longer moored securely to its foundations. It shows us how people behave when they're still religious, but have lost all knowledge of what truly pleases God. They do whatever is right in their own eyes, and they expect God to bless them for doing it. Dan, the, the tribe of Dan in the north, would for more than 400 years be the center in that entire area, the center for idolatry. First under Jonathan, the grand or great-grandson of Moses, later under an evil king named Jeroboam, who shaped his own golden calves. Because we are fallen creatures, sin and rebellion against God come quite naturally to us. It's like water flowing downstream. And this is the legacy of the tribe of Dan. Rather than give themselves to the God who was fully revealed to them through the law, they did what was right in their own eyes and they fell prey to their own ever-developing evil. May God protect our hearts. May we be people of the word of God. May we be people who walk in relationship with God. We need to tabernacle. We need, to tab we need to be in relationship with him always. We need to be his children. We can't be his grandchildren. We need to be his children living in relationship with him, that our hearts are not deceived and that we be not led astray. Next week, we're going to open the 19th chapter in Judges and go a little further. Until then, Father, I pray your blessing on your people as they follow after you. May we be faithful, O Lord, to come before you, even as we cannot gather publicly together right now, may we be faithful in coming before you with our prayer and supplication, our sacrifice of praise, 
May we give you our hearts holy and walk in obedience to your word. And we do pray, Lord, we pray for the opening of doors here in North Carolina that we, the church, would be able to assemble together and enjoy the presence of the body of Christ, the presence of Jesus himself as we live and move together in the earth. We give you thanks for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good night and God bless. What a great word from Pastor David. I hope that brought some encouragement to your home today. If this ministry has impacted your life in any way, and you wanna partner with us financially to impact the world for the kingdom, you can click the Give button on your screen or go to calvarytriad.com forward slash give. Be sure to stay connected through our church app with sermons, devotionals, youth and kids lessons, and more. Thanks for watching. Have a great week. God bless.